in this video I will go through uh, Kant's analogies of experience from his critique of pure reason and so there's quite a bit to get through here so I've kind of pre-typed out quite a bit of stuff here that I'm going to sort of read through and then commentate on as I go through it and so this one like I said is a bit longer and so Kant gives this sort of analogy of experience that sort of applies to all three of the analogies of experience here uh, and then he gives one for each of the three so the the substance the causality and the reciprocity uh, sort of categories of understanding or pure concepts and so in the first edition of the critique of pure reason he gave this as the sort of general the more general version as regards their existence all appearances stand a priori under rules of the determination of their relation to each other in one time then in the second edition he reworded it a bit to say experience is possible only through the representation of a necessary connection of perceptions and so uh, that's what uh, essentially each of these things are going to try to do and so essentially what that's doing is so you may have heard of the of uh, David Hume so David Hume and his sort of critique of causality of saying that uh, that that saying that a causes B so saying a causes B according to David Hume is only that we've seen a we've seen a precede B uh, we've seen a precede B enough times that we just sort of start assuming that a is causing B and so Kant wants to say that this is not the case that uh, that there is actually this uh, sort of necessary this necessary connection connection uh, and so he wants to come up with rules and so that's why he says over here stand a priori under rules of the determination of the relation to each other and so he wants to say that at least as we experience it there are a priori rules uh, that we use to understand how things work uh, and so for this he says that time has three modes there's persistence succession and simultaneity and so the first analogy will be uh, will be using the category so the category of understanding the category of substance uh, is required for the experience of persistence the second analogy uh, says that the category of causality is required for the experience of succession so uh, so persistence being uh, a, an object or something that we're experiencing uh, persisting through time so being the same thing at time t1 as it is at time t2 uh, and then the category of causality is required for the experience of succession which is uh, sort of the idea that uh, the thing at time t1 precedes the thing at time t2 but even stronger than that that the thing at time t1 uh, causes the thing at time t2 that the thing at time t1 was necessary in order for what happened at time t2 to actually occur uh, and so uh, we, we will get into that here in a little bit and so the third analogy here uh, the category of mutual interaction is required for the experience of simultaneity so the experience that that you know we have some object we have some object here a and we have some other object here B that we are looking at uh, and that these are both uh, at the place that they are at at the same time uh, even though they are you know two different objects all right and so the 
the analogies are to determine the relation of, a, of appearances to one another. Uh, so they bring the existence of appearances under rules, but Kant goes through some pains to say that they do not produce the appearances. So the uh, the things we talked about in the previous video, the, sort of the quantity and quality, are sort of the thing that, that produce appearances, where Kant says that the analogies are regulative instead of constitutive. Uh, so we cannot say using these what something is or how great, like what, to what degree it's there, only that it is necessary via these rules. Uh, that is necessarily by these rules connected to other perceptions. And so the way I liked to break it down was if we have, say, x plus y equals z, then we would say that x, y, and z are constituents, uh, constituents. Uh, and so that would be the the quantity, the quantity and quality that we talked about in the previous video, uh, where the plus and the equals uh, are the the regulatory. So the regulatory, regulatory, and so that is the. The, uh, so that's what we're talking about here with these analogies. So the uh, analogies of experience. And so they're the thing that sort of connect, they connect all these, uh, these quantities and qualities. So uh, the each sort of individual actual moment of experience, you could say, uh, is made out of this quantity and this quality. And then the different experiences are brought together uh, by these analogies of experience in the same way that X, Y, and Z are brought together by this plus and this equals. And so Kant also says that uh, that his sort of psychological taxonomy here, so intuition, intuition is the form of appearances. So remember that was the, the quantity, the quantity. Uh, then he says perception, perception uh, is the matter the matter of appearances and I'm just going to put app there and that was the quality and he says that experience then experience is the relation the relation of of uh, of appearances and so this is the one that we are talking about now so this is just kind of another way of saying you know what I put up here and so I actually turned this into kind of like a a mathematical function where we have s uh, we have s as a as a function of appearances as a function of appearances is equal to and then i put intuition intuition and then as sort of the plus or minus here uh, i put experiences experiences uh, and then perception perception like that uh, and uh, put square bracket there and so this is kind of like the the X and the plus and the Y here uh, and so 
this S here, this S being the schema, the schema, which is, uh, which is a function, a function of appearances, appearances. And uh, if we do not have appearances, so let me scroll down just a little bit more here, uh, without appearances, so, so schema, schema without appearances, and I'll just put app again there, are the categories. So the categories, as I've been saying, are sort of these abstract rules, uh, and they're kind of nothing without appearances. Uh, and so when we sort of bring appearances to the categories, then we get this this sort of schema function here. And the schema function could be seen as being this sort of intuition, experiences, perception in sort of this X plus Y form. Uh, or at least this is the way that I have sort of uh, conceptualized it. Like I said, this, uh, this sort of interpretation here is not uh, from Kant's book and it's not even from the uh, the Con or the Cambridge Companion to Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which uh, is pretty much what I'm going to be relying heavily on uh, for the remainder of this video because uh, Eric Watkins, who writes the the chapter, is chapter six in this book called The System of Principles, he does a really, really good job of sort of uh, d distilling everything down to to um, you know making it into a quicker and e more easily consumable form that is you know really nice for a video and uh, I mean I'm not going to be recapitulating his entire chapter here so if if you want to get more in depth on it and particularly uh, his criticisms and answering answering criticisms that people have had about these about this uh, part of the book, uh, then I would recommend picking up that Cambridge Companion and reading that. For this, I'm pretty much just going to use what Eric Watkins wrote as his sort of summarizing Kant's arguments here. And so, like I said, I'm going to be pretty much leaning heavily on that. Uh, and so, yeah, so I have here the analogies of experience from Eric Watkins's the system of principles and the Cambridge Companion to Kant's critique of pure reason. And so now we're getting into these uh, sort of specific analogies. And so the first analogy of experience is all appearances contain that which persists uh, or substance um, as the object itself and that which can change as its mere determination, i.e. the way in which the object exists. And in the second edition, he adds uh, this uh, further clarification that uh, the quantity of the permanent substance doesn't increase or decrease in time, uh, regardless of changes in its nature. Uh, and so this, as I said in other videos, goes back to that sort of Aristotelian and scholastic idea that was still popular at the time that if we have some subject is P, so we're predicating P of some subject, that the subject is a, a substance, a substance that uh, is basically just whatever the thing is without any predicates. And then the predicates are sort of, are sometimes called accidents accidents. So these are, uh, these are essentially the things that you predicate of the subject. These are, in, uh, according to Kant, uh, these accidents or predicates are the way in which the object exists. And so these are sort of the things that you can, uh, you can actually observe and experience about 
uh, about some object or some substance. Uh, and so substance is the thing that persists in time because if we have some subject, uh, we can have is, you know, P1 is P2, you know, at time T1 and at time T2. Uh, and so this right here is not necessarily true of the substance at all times uh, because it, the substance could change and become some other thing. And I think in a previous video I used the example that if we had some car, so if we had some car, so sorry, say S is moving at 50 miles per hour, uh, so at T1, we can also have S is moving at 51 miles per hour at T2. So this, uh, this moving at some speed is changing, but the S is staying the same. The substance is staying the same. Uh, and, you know, this could, you know, this kind of goes into a lot of other sort of issues with this idea of substance, like the ship of Theseus and things like that. And, you know, like what is the substance of a human if our, if the material we're made out of is sort of changed out every, you know, so many years or whatever. But uh, for Kant, the substance is sort of the unchanging thing. And then the accidents or these predicates of the substance are the things that are changing. So now let's get into the argument here. And so uh, this argument is uh, pretty much, you know, a recapitulation verbatim of uh, Eric Watkins. I, the only thing I really changed was making it a numbered list. Uh, but so the first part of the argument is time is a permanently per persisting substratum in which other modes of time, succession and simultaneity, in all appearances must be represented. Uh, but then the second part, we do not perceive time itself. Uh, and so Kant says that we don't actually perceive time itself. We, we aren't like outside of time looking at time. So we're not perceiving it itself. Uh, and then number three here, therefore, to have cognition, uh, of or even represent appearances as temporal, uh, for example, successive, one must identify a permanent substratum that can represent time in appearances. Uh, and so this, these first three steps here is essentially Kant saying that time itself can't be the substance. Time itself uh, can't represent well, it can't represent the persistence of things by itself. And so we are going to need some other thing here. Uh, so then number four, he says, the appearances we immediately apprehend are always changing. And so, like I said, that's sort of this idea that, you know, we can have uh, predicate one at time T1 and predicate two at time T2. Uh, but then substance, he says, is the substratum of everything real, is permanent, and thus only, and thus the only object of perception that can represent time. Uh, and so we, we understand time through the persistence of this substance uh, in in time. Uh, and so number six, therefore. If we are to have cognition of appearances as successive, these appearances must be represented as the successive states of a permanent substance. Uh, and so that is sort of the the rule here of persistence that uh, that the that to have the appearances of something as successive, these appearances must be represented as as sort of changes in some permanent substance. And so. Uh, I think I've talked about uh, in previous videos the example with this car example. Uh, we wouldn't say that at time T1 here that 
that we have some completely different car than we have here at time T2. Uh, so we under we can understand the passage of time because we know that this this substance here, this S, uh, remains the same even when something when this other thing here is changing. Uh, and so that is sort of how we can understand time since uh, as was established in the first three parts here, we do not actually perceive time itself. Um, and so, like I said, there are, you know, issues like with the ship of Theseus, like, uh, you know, if you have, you know, a ship sitting in the bay uh, at, and you start changing out components of it over, you know, some period of time, say 30 years until every piece has been switched out is it still the same ship, you know, because we could kind of say, you know, that if S is our ship, you know, S, you know, is, is say the, the, the collection, the collection of, you know, of parts X, Y, Z, and so on. But if X, Y, and Z are changed out, so now, S is the collection of parts A, B, C, and so on. Is it still the same ship? But uh, but Kant doesn't go into this. This is just sort of a, a little editorial I'm giving off to the side here. But anyway, uh, there are issues with this. It just essentially just to show that there are issues with this idea of substance being this sort of uh, this sort of thing without any predicates upon which we predicate uh, these sort of accidents, the sort of uh, observable exper experiential things about the object. And so there is, you know, this idea of substance is kind of uh, is not really in vogue anymore. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of uh, beside the point. So this, like I said, is the first analogy of experience, uh, which is the persistence of the substance. Uh, and so the next one here, so the second analogy, which has to do with cause and effect. Uh, so the second analogy of experience uh, is all alterations occur in accordance with the law of the connection of cause and effect. And so an alteration is a change of state of a substance, which Kant calls an event. Every event occurs according to a causal rule. So this is that idea of rule again, that uh, Kant is saying that it's not the sort of David Hume, like this thing, has preceded this other thing enough times that I've just sort of started saying that this thing must cause the other thing. He's saying that Kant is saying that there is uh, some causal rule. Uh, for every event, there must be a causal rule in accordance with which this occurrence always and necessarily flows. And so once again, that's that sort of anti-human uh, idea that, that if we have a if we say that A causes B, that it will always and necessarily, that B will always and necessarily follow A. And so uh, Watkins actually says that Kant makes sort of two different uh, arguments in this part. And so I will go through these two arguments uh, one after the other. So the first kind of argument, and so this part, uh, is written by me, so this isn't from uh, this isn't from Watkins' uh, chapter. Uh, where it, I, I called it the psychological argument, since it depends on Kant's taxonomy of cognitive psychology. You know things like the sensibility, and I think I wrote imagination twice here. This this was supposed to be intuition, uh, but you know all those different faculties that. Kant is always using like, you know, sensibility and the intuition and the imagination and things like that. So this, uh, this 
first argument sort of leans heavily on that uh, that taxonomy that Kant has established uh, prior in in the critique of pure reason. All right, so this now it's back to uh, to what Watkins is saying. So the first part is the succession of two states of an object cannot be represented either in sensibility's intuition or the imagination synthesis, because neither can be rep can represent the kind of objective connection contained in the change of its states. Uh, and so what he's saying, so the success of or the succession of two states of an object cannot be represented. So he's saying this is essentially making uh, so saying um, uh, essentially making Hume's argument here uh, that the succession of two states of an object can't be represented in the sensibilities intuition or the imagination synthesis. And then I have down here the A and B. Uh, which are the reasons why he says it can't be represented in the sensibilities intuition or in the imagination synthesis. So our intuition of A at time T1 and A at time T2 are isolated from each other and do not in themselves represent their temporal relations. So you can't say if you look at sort of A at time T1, so A at T1 and A at T2. Uh, there's nothing in A at T1 uh, that says that A at T2 must follow T, uh, A at T1. Uh, so there is no way, just, for, uh, just from our intuition, so just from our intuition, that we could say that one of these things must follow the other. Uh, and so the... Uh, the, it can't be uh, represented in the imagination synthesis because the imagination, which, as I said, is that sort of recalling of previous representations uh, in order to sort of synthesize uh, a full representation or a concept. Uh, since it's recalling those different representations, it's free to represent a at T2 as occurring prior to A at T1, if it so chooses. And so once again, we can't say that one of these things must happen before the other one or the other way around. And so Kant says, only the understanding's category of causality is able to represent the proper kind of connection. And so he's essentially saying that this is the thing that, that Hume, uh, that Hume neglected neglected so Hume was essentially making his argument by only considering uh, our intuition and our imagination uh, and so Kant is saying that Hume neglected this idea that we have the this category of the understanding that is the category of causality which is able to represent the proper kind of connection uh, and therefore to have cognition of objective succession we must apply the category of causality. And so you can see how this is very dependent on Kant's uh, sort of taxonomy of, of uh, sort of cognitive faculties where, you know, he's saying like Hume neglected, you know, this category of causality. And it's like, well, yeah, but you are the one who came up with this idea of this category of causality. Uh, I mean, Kant doesn't say sort of outright that Hume neglected this, but, you know, this is sort of, I guess, the implication if you're kind of reading between the lines here. Uh, and so uh, Watkins gives this other, or says that Kant makes this other argument that uh, uh, doesn't depend on Kant's uh, sort of taxonomy of, you know, cognitive faculties here. And so this is the second argument uh, according to Watkins. So like I said, this is structured verbatim to Watkins' presentation, even using the P1, P2, C1 for premise one, premise two, and conclusion one. Uh, so this is exactly the way that uh, Watkins structured this argument. Uh, and so premise one is the apprehension of objects 
the subjective order of perceptions is always successive uh, premise two there is a distinction between the subjective order of perceptions and these sub in these successive states of an object such that no immediate inference from the former to the latter is possible. Uh, and so he's saying that the, the uh, subjective order of perceptions in the actual successive states of an object uh, that we can't actually infer uh, one from the other, that there is the objective, the objective uh, sort of um, succession of states. So if we have state A going to state B uh, objectively and we apprehend or perceive state A and then afterwards state B that we can't, uh, because we perceive this one, we can't say that this is uh, the, the way that it is objectively, nor can we say that uh, if this is the objective way it is, that this is the way that we would actually perceive it. Uh, and so the first conclusion is one cannot immediately infer objective succession from the successive order of perceptions. Uh, and so the subjective perceptions do not tell you what the objective sequence is. Uh, so in which order events actually occur which is what I was saying up here, just because you perceive things happening in one way doesn't mean that it actually happened in one way. Uh, and so this is a quote right from, uh, right from Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Oh, and by the way, these ones that I have bulleted out like this, these do not appear in Watkins. Uh, Watkins um, so I guess I shouldn't have said verbatim here, but uh, these are things I have added in to clarify things. The only ones that start with the P or the C like that uh, is how Watkins had it. Uh, so yeah, just to clarify that I have added these sort of bulleted parts under here. So Kant says, uh, uh, basically saying exactly what I sort of just said, but I must therefore derive the subjective sequence of apprehension from the objective sequences of apprehension. Uh, I think I said that that wasn't allowed up here. Uh, so, but it, it is. So, so to, to clarify, I guess, the subjective perceptions do not tell you what the objective sequence is. Therefore, I must derive the subjective sequence uh, from the objective sequence. So it uh, it goes from objective down to subjective, but we do not go from subjective up to objective. So yeah, just to clarify that. All right, so now we have premise three. So to have knowledge of objective succession, the object states must be subject to a rule that de determines them as successive. And so only by assuming that a change of state proceeds according to a rule, can I be justified in saying of the appearance itself and not merely of my apprehension that a sequence is to be encountered in it? Uh, and so once again, that's just saying that, that if I want that, say, we have the objective sequence uh, of A going to B, and then this sort of, uh, sort of says that my my um, my sort of subjective apprehension is of A going to B, that there must be some some rule here, some rule here in uh, in my apprehension of it in order for this to be uh, for this to be sort of uh, valid. And so I wrote here uh, that the the rule, this rule that we have here, uh, is a justification for the belief that one event caused another. Uh, in other words, it is epistemological. Uh, I wrote not ontological here, but there is an ontological aspect to it. But uh, I think in premise three here, it's focusing mostly on this epistemological idea that there has to be a rule. Uh, and so then we go on to premise four here. 
any rule that determines objective succession must include a relation of condition to conditioned, that is, that of the causal dependence of successive states uh, upon a cause. So saying that up here that B, that B is dependent upon A, that A is, you know, some conditions that must obtain in order for B to then happen. Uh, so ontologically speaking, uh, so ontologically must be that given a preceding condition, necessarily, necessarily the later state follows the earlier state. Uh, and epistemologically must entail knowledge that the condition has been satisfied when one knows that the change of state occurs. Uh, so that's the justificatory rule is a causal rule. And so ontologically, it's saying that, uh, that, uh, that if A, if A is, you know, some, some list of conditions X, Y, in Z, that all, all three of the, well, you know, any number of conditions, but I'm just using three as an example here. If these conditions, if these conditions, if these conditions obtain, uh, then B occurs. And so, uh, so ontologically it must be that a given preceding condition necess that given a preceding condition necessarily the latter state follows from the earlier state uh, and so uh, so if if these conditions obtain uh, then b will occur and so then b and i'll even put necessarily necessarily occurs uh, and epistemologically uh, it says must entail knowledge that the condition has been satisfied when one knows that the change of state occurs. So that's saying that if if we see some state of affairs A at time T0 and it goes to some state of affairs B at time T1, then we can know uh, based on the rule of causality that these uh, that these um, conditions obtained that these X, Y, and Z obtained uh, if, if we see that change from, uh, from A to B. Uh, and so then conclusion two, to have knowledge of the successive states of an object, the object's successive states must be dependent upon a cause, that is, must stand under a causal rule. Uh, and so that is what he was sort of trying to prove here that we have to have this causal rule. And so it is not the humane sense of, you know, thing A happens and then, and then thing B happens. And I've seen this, you know, so and so many times. So I just started saying that A causes B. Uh, it's Kant is saying that there must be uh, some causal rule. Uh, and then of course, in the first, um, the first argument up here, uh, that causal rule was the category of causality. And so that is, uh, that is the, the analogy of experience for causality. Uh, and then um, the analogy of experience for reciprocity or community is, is very similar to his, his uh, argument for uh, the causality, but I'm going to sort of list uh, a few important uh, sort of subtleties here that make it different. So his third analogy of experience uh, is that all substances, insofar as they are simultaneously, stand in thoroughgoing community, i.e. interaction with one another. And so... Uh, when, with this, uh, so with causality, the order in which things are perceived did matter, but for simultaneity, the order in which things are perceived does not matter. So that's kind of a big difference between causality and community. And so this quote uh, 
right from the critique is things are simultaneous when an empirical intuition, the perceptions can follow upon one another reciprocally. Uh, in other words, thus I can observe first the moon and afterwards the earth, or conversely, first the earth and afterwards the moon. And because the perceptions of these objects can follow one another reciprocally, I say that the objects are simultaneous. Uh, and so that's what simultaneity means, is that uh, it doesn't matter in which order you perceived the objects. You know, you can have A, B, and C, and if you perceive A before B before C, uh, it doesn't, and it doesn't change what you actually experience if you instead perceived it C before B before A, uh, then these things are simultaneous. Uh, and so object A being in some re in this relation, which I put X sub uh, one to two to object B and reciprocally object B being in relation X sub two to one to A determines their simultaneity. And I did this X with the, the little uh, subscript there because I wanted to show that, you know, it's the, it's essentially the same, the same uh, relationship. So if you have A uh, sort of in the upper left corner and B in the bottom right corner, that, you know, the re relationship of A to B, so X one to two is, you know, the same as B, which is X two to one here. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're standing in this sort of reciprocal, uh, this reciprocal sort of relationship to each other. Uh, and so Watkins also gives the example of like uh, two sort of celestial objects so maybe like like a planet and its moon sort of being in this reciprocal relationship where the gravitational pull of earth on the moon is happening at the same time as the moon on the earth and so there's this sort of simultaneous causation going on where the earth is causing the moon is causing some change in the moon's motion, uh, while simultaneously the moon is causing some change in the Earth's motion. Uh, and so there is this sort of reciprocal and uh, simultaneous causality occurring. Uh, and so one cannot immediately perceive the object, the objective simultaneity, so the objective simultaneity of two states, nor can one immediately infer the objective simultaneity of two states from the order of apprehension. So when you look at A and B, uh, so the first part is saying that just looking at them, you can't perceive the objective simultaneity, nor would you, if you looked at A first and then B, be able to determine some simultaneity, nor if you looked at B first and then A second would you be able to uh, determine some simultaneity? And so only a rule could warrant an inference to objective simultaneity. And in fact, only a special kind of causal rule called community or mutual interaction. And so that is what, uh, what Kant's idea of, of community or mutual interaction uh, or uh, sort of simultaneity is, um, and so that is sort of how it differs from from cause and effect, but is uh, still the same, and obviously still the same insofar as it requires this uh, this rule, uh, which is you know when the category of understanding where community is that uh, that category of understanding. Uh, but anyway, that is it for this video. Uh, like I said, uh, this, this was for the analogies of experience, and it's the way that uh, we sort of combine all of our sort of individual representations together uh, in order to make it understandable for us. Uh, I don't want to ramble on too long. I hope you found this video interesting and helpful in your 
quest to understand this sort of difficult and uh, obscure text. Uh, but anyway, I will see you in the next video.